Really appreciate it. All right, today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 11 through 32. And uh, the, the scripture we're going to read uh, comes from the ESV. There are ESV Bibles uh, under your chairs if you're here in person. If you're joining us online, sometimes I know it can be kind of hard to read the scripture, so you may want to look that up on your own. Um, and I'll be reading the scripture for us, um, and then we'll all respond with thanks be to God at the end. And so once you are ready to read the scripture, again, it's Luke 15, 11 through 32, we ask that you please stand as able for the reading of God's word. If you're joining us uh, here in person, uh, feel free to do that. If you're joining us at home, if you're comfortable doing that, feel free to do that as well. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us today. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, friends, uh, we're going to take a little bit uh, of a break from our uh, sermon series that we just started, um, Seek First, where we're talking about uh, how we can practically seek the kingdom of God in our lives. And so definitely join us next week for that. We're really excited about that sermon series. But we're also excited because today we have a, a guest speaker. Uh, his name is Pastor Patrick Chi. And he has joined uh, the Campus and Postgrad retreat this past weekend. And the theme of the retreat was authentic intimacy. And uh, Patrick is a brother who's originally from L.A., uh, the L.A. area, but uh, has been living in New York the last five years. And uh, we we're just so blessed to have him. Uh, I mean, I think the, the, the theme was really perfect for the speaker that we had because Pastor Patrick that we saw was just a really authentic, real dude. And he just shared with us from his heart. And uh, it, it was a, a really awesome time. And so we're really excited to have him speak for us on this Sunday. And so without further ado, I wanted to welcome Pastor Patrick. Let's give him a, a hand. Welcome. Thank you, brother. Uh, good morning. Uh, man, um, it's good to see some familiar faces. See a lot of new faces. And I am... A little nervous, if I can be honest. Um, I feel like, uh, yeah, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to pray for us and we'll, we'll get started. Uh, dear loving and gracious Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we just say thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness over our lives, God. 
whether we see it, whether we believe it, whether we feel it, thank you, God, that this truth is unshakable, that you are still faithless even when we remain, that you are faithful even when we remain faithless. And I ask, Lord, as you have um, given me another opportunity to preach um, every single week, Lord, I just say thank you. It is by your grace, God, that you could use someone like me to be a blessing to your people. And as I'm here, God, I ask for your help. I ask for courage. I ask for a sound mind. I ask, God, that you may still um, the loud emotions I may be fe feeling so that I may be able to really um, look at you, um, acknowledge your presence here, and really serve your people. Remind me once again, God, that it is not about me in this moment, but it is all about you being glorified and me serving your people. And God, I need your help. I need your anointing. I need your guidance. I need your leading. Because apart from you, I can do no good thing. So Holy Spirit, anoint me. Fill me up. Give me the exact words I must say. Let me carry out your will today so your people can draw closer to you. Thank you, God, for this time. Thank you for being so good. And we pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. <clears throat> um, a little bit about me. Um, I, I graduated culinary school. I love food. Um, I, I love food a, a bit too much, okay? Um, got to a point where all I did was, as a hobby, it was eating, you know? I didn't eat because I was hungry. I ate because it gave me joy, you know? And um, there's a steakhouse in New York called Peter Luger's. Really expensive, and uh, last week, a friend of mine wanted to treat me out, so I'm like, <laughs> let's go, you know, I love steak, and um, Peter Luger's is just so delicious. The first time I had it, 2017, I flew to New York because I was guest speaking at a retreat, and um, my friend picks me up who grew up in New York, he's like, and I'm like, hey, yo, can we go eat? I'm hungry, and he's like, you know, what do you want to eat? I'm like, McDonald's, right? Oh, I heard you guys got White Castle. Because when I was there, at this time, I was living in California. California, we don't got White Castle. He goes, hey, you know what? Have you ever, ever had Peter Luger's? I'm like, isn't that a steakhouse? He goes, yeah. I'm like, no, man, and I don't got the money for it. Like, I'm not, I don't want it. And he goes, yeah, you know what? Like, don't worry about it. I got you. Like, let me bless you. I'm like, no, man. Like, <laughs> No, it's too expensive. Like, I, I, I don't feel comfortable. He's, he looked at me, and he goes, are you sure? I'm like, oh, I don't know now, right? And then after, I'm like, you know what? No, I feel bad. He goes, all right, then. And I'm like, I lost my chance, right? I'm like, are you sure you want to bless me? He starts laughing, right? He goes, you know what? Even if you want a McDonald's, I still want to bless you. We go there, and like I said, I graduated culinary school. Um, I worked as a grill cook for many years, so... I know how to cook a really delicious steak, right? I sit down, we're talking, catching up, having a, it was great. Steak comes out, it looks crazy, right? Like the big porterhouse comes, it's like sizzling. I'm like, ooh, it smells delicious. But if I'm going to be honest, I'm like, I wonder how good this steak can be. Because what can beat my steak, right? <laughs> like not trying to be arrogant or boastful, but like I can cook a pretty mean steak. Comes out, cut it, take a bite, and I kid you not, there was a party in my mouth, right? <laughs> How is a steak so good? That being said, because it's so expensive, like, I don't go there often, right? Be foolish for me to go there often, but then, you know, this past, last week, a friend of mine wanted to treat me out. We go, and I was so happy, right? Few days leading up to that day, all I could think about was Peter Luger's steak, like, you know, I'm like eating like something I, I like to eat a lot. Um, and, and my wife like cooks, like whenever we're like busy on the fly, it's just like, like cooking kimchi, you know, and like, and like tuna, you know. So I'm like eating that and I'm like, man, I can't wait for steak. I'm like eating other things. I'm like, I can't wait for steak. I get there. I was so happy. I was like... <laughs> Sinfully, I feel like I was so satisfied, right? It comes, right? Like, so like the sides come, the bread come, and then once the steak comes, I take a bite. I, I, I cut it, I take a bite. I'm like, oh my goodness. I just enjoy that moment, right, of silence, just eating the steak. 
please, if you guys ever visit New York, save up money. It is worth it, okay? Why am I sharing this? It's because leading up to that day, it was last Monday, I'm like, I want, all I'm dreaming about is Peter Luger's, right? I desired it, and I don't think it's bad desiring many things, right? Having many desires is not sinful. I think it, it, just, re, it just reveals to us our humanity. As people, we have interests. As people, we have many passions. And as people, we have many desires. If I was able to grant you one wish today, what would it be? I, I think most of us, on the top of our minds, will probably be like, money, right? And I'm like, and if I would respond, like, are you sure? You would probably second guess, hmm, what do I really want? You wouldn't think about what's going to give me most things, but you would probably think about what do you really want, especially today, right? For some of us, it could be a job. Other people, it could be in a rela- being in a relationship. Some of you guys might be that promotion that you've been wanting at work. Like, what is that desire? I say this because if you read in this passage, we're able to see two brothers having this desire and they're seeking other things. The younger brother at least goes into the world. The older brother tries to find satisfaction in the things that he does for his father. I say this because it's not bad having many desires, but I think we got to understand it is good to have desires. It is good to have passions. It is good to have interests. But these things we must always remember will never fully satisfy the void in our hearts. You see, if you, see, if you read in this passage, I'm going to go ahead and read on. Um, verse 12, it says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, took a journey far into the country, took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. Imagine having the audacity to go into your father and be like, when are you going to die? So I can get my inheritance. That's basically what's, what's happening in this passage Guess what's rightfully his, right? And the father being very too gracious, right? Like if I was the father, I'm like, son, I, I don't have a son, so I don't know, right? But then me just reading this, I'm like, I would expect a backhand to come, right? I would expect some form of discipline. But what does the father do? The father graciously gives what is rightfully the younger sons, right? And the younger son receives an inheritance and then leaves home and squandered all of his property in reckless living. I I say this because I think many times when we go about our own lives, right, um, whether it's going to college, whether you're starting to work, and then it becomes a bit more mundane, I I I realize we begin to Try to fill the void in our hearts. Try to seek after things that will really satisfy our hearts. And I think we're always met with being let down. Like, for instance, um, I had, um, I I, I got a new car last year. You know, um, um, someone's like, hey, you know, Pastor Patrick, I want to bless you with a car. I'm like, what are you talking about? You want to bless me with a car? Like, Hot Wheels, toy car, right? They wanted to bless me with a car. So I'm like, wow, you know, so I'm like talking about used cars, and this person was like, no, I want you to get a car that you will enjoy. I'm like, oh, I don't know about this, because are you sure, you know? And then after we're having a lot of conversation, and I, I, I felt really bad. Like, what? Why would you want to give me a nice car? I say this because... After I got the new car, I'm like super happy, right? Months leading up to it, I'm like dreaming about the car. It was going to come on this. It's going to come in May. And once I got my car, like I was scared to drive it. 
I was like, it's beautiful, it's nice, it's white, it's electric, like, oh, uh, I feel so good. And if I'm going to be honest, I was so happy, right? I'm like trying to show off to my friends, but not really trying to show off because I don't want to seem like that type of person. And I'm like happy. I'm like washing my car like every week. I was happy. But then a couple weeks later, it just became another car. I got a new phone because my iPhone 11 broke, right? I'm like waiting till the I iPhone 14 came in the mail. Once I got it, I'm like three cameras, right? It looks so ugly, you know? <laughs> if I'm gonna be honest, it was like by the third day, I'm like, it's just another phone. I, I say this because although it is, there's nothing wrong with being excited for new things, right? Especially, I love new things, right? It can be something really cheap, but if it's new, I love it. I, I say this because there's nothing wrong with being excited. There's nothing wrong with having desires, but we must understand that trying to, trying to fill our satisfaction cannot be found in this world. Many people try to find it in relationships, even friendships. People try to find it in careers, in success, in achievements. But we must understand, although these things are good, they will never fully satisfy us. We could try to climb the ranks of, of the corporate ladder, but we're going to never be fully satisfied. You could have all the money in the world, but you will never fully be satisfied. I remember meeting um, a, a businessman, a very rich businessman when I, would, when, I, when I was evangelizing, suit, really nice BMW that you don't see very often, and I'm like, excuse me, sir, can I talk to you about Jesus for two minutes? Looked at me, he's like, please do, I love my Lord and Savior, and I'm like, whoa, how do I evangelize to someone who's a Christian, right? And of course, I didn't evangelize him, we're having conversation, and he was telling me, the reason why I became a Christian is because I'm very rich. I have everything I want in life. I got a beautiful home, beautiful wife, beautiful family, cute dogs, like great job. I, I'm rich, but I was not satisfied. That's why I became a Christian. I'm like, amen. That's really inspiring. Right? I, I say this because I think that's what the gospel is, right? It's not just securing our eternal life. Right? It's not just securing... Uh, our souls where we go to heaven, but it's about a relationship you begin to enter into, right? And this relationship will really satisfy the voids in our hearts and in our souls. You see this younger brother, what he does is he, because of this void, he goes out into the world seeking to fill that void. You know, I don't know if that's all of us here, but I think maybe some of us might have experienced that. The moment you go to college, you experience freedom. You're not with your parents anymore. You could do certain, you could go to parties and you can do certain things trying to fill this void. Other people, it won't look like that, but it could look very different, right? Studying extremely hard just so you could get those specific grades to try to fill that satisfaction of your heart. Just because it looks different doesn't mean it's not the same, right? Because at the end of the day, the root is trying to fill this void in our hearts. You know, this, 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 this younger son kind of crazy, right? Goes to the dad, yo, when are you going to die? Give me what belongs to me. It's like the son doesn't even view the father as his father, Right? It, he, he objectifies his father as someone who's going to give him money and inheritance. Right? If you, if you continue to read on, this is what happens. Verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Of course, right? Verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to be one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into, the, into his fields to feed pigs. And he was long to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. He became desperate. Just like I shared with you guys, the man I was evangelizing to, and then we had a conversation, he also became desperate. Desperate, not because he was in need, but because he realized he had so much, but yet his heart, his spirit was still very 
poor. That's why it says in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's not just about being desperate or having nothing. It's about understanding that when you realize that there is a void in my heart, it can be filled with the blessings of God. In this passage, he says, you know, um, verse 16, it says, And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's higher servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise, go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Verse 20. And you arose and came to his father. And I'm going to stop there because I want to share a story. High school, I was very rebellious. I was like a thug. I know. Praise the Lord because... I am a miracle. <laughs> I want to share a funny story, bad story, so please do not follow the, my example. But I got caught stealing at Target. Um, what I used to do, because we struggle financially, we would go steal games, and I would steal it at like another game store. So I could get a couple bucks to buy dinner or buy lunch. And as I was doing that, um, yeah, I got caught stealing games. I got arrested, and I was put in the holding cell. And they're like, You're gonna, we're going to call your mother. And I was like, oh, that means my mom has to pick me up. That means I can't go to a party tonight. And I was really bummed out. I wasn't really bummed out because I got caught. I was bummed out because I couldn't go hang out with my friends and go to a party that night. But, you know, I was in the holding cell for a couple of hours, and then they called my mom. I talked to my mom on the phone. I was telling her, like, Oh, like, what they're telling you is not true. Something happened. I was, like, framed, hung up the phone, right? And I'm like, okay, I got to think of something where I don't get in that much trouble. Because I realized I'm going to get in trouble. But what can I say? What can I come up with where I don't get in that much trouble? For some reason, you know, the police officers let us go. As I walked out, called my mom on the phone again. She's like, what happened? I'm like, you know, I'll tell you everything when I get home. Like, it's not what it seems like. That's why they let us go, right? Like, I'm like lying my way, you know. Of course, when I get home, I was telling her, I don't know why, but my friend stole games and put it in my backpack, and I didn't feel it, you know. She looked at me. She goes, oh, really? You think I'm stupid, you know, in Korean? I'm like, I'm so sorry, right? Like, I couldn't think of a better life, which, which is, I guess, is a good thing, you know, but... I share this story because I remember the feelings I had, right? Like, I'm so scared. Like, I'm going to get in big trouble. What is my mom going to think? She's going to feel so ashamed. She will probably feel guilty as a mother. Like, well, how did I raise my son? Like, so I'm thinking about all these things, right? And, and, and as I'm thinking about these things, I'm feeling certain emotions. I, I feel scared. I, I feel anxious. I feel worried. Like, Man, like, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen tonight when I get in trouble? There's many things I'm feeling so, because of that, I'm trying to think of a way out of this situation, right? How can I still be good with my mom? How can I not get in that much trouble where I can still have fun with my friends? I say this because I feel like I can relate with this person here. You know, he's desperate. He's eating the same food as the pigs are eating. Like, look, think about how desperate he was, right? So he comes to his senses. He's like, you know what? Even the people who work for my dad gets good food. So I will say, you know what? I'll probably go home, try to give, God, uh, try to give my dad a genuine apology. And because of what I've done was so dishonorable, if you read the book of Leviticus, he was acting like, like he should have been stoned, right? If you read the book, book of Le Leviticus, it's, it's crazy. So for him, he's probably knowing, like, I deserve death, but because my father's so gracious, there's no way he'll take me back as a son. So you know what? Please, I'm hoping that he will take me as a hired servant. Let me work for him. Because at least if I work for him, I'll get fed. I'll have food. I won't be sharing, I won't be, I won't be sharing meals. I won't be breaking bread with pigs, right? So he comes up, starts going to his father. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father 
saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and, a, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. I love this because midway apology, right? Midway apology, the son's like, I have sinned against heaven and you. I am sorry. The father cuts him off, doesn't even regard what he's saying. He's like, hey, servants, bring what I need so I can love on my son. Bring the robe, best robe, bring the ring, bring shoes, take out the fattened calf because we're going to eat Peter Luger's, right? I'm like, man, let's eat Peter Luger's. Like, I love this because this reveals to us the heart of God. It's not just when we're, when we're living in quote-unquote sin, but it's when our hearts are wandering away from God, God always responds with his Grace, mind you, sin isn't always about what you do. It's the posture of our hearts. Did you know Christians are the people who have to repent for the good things they've done, for the bad things they've done, and the good things? It's, it's not just, oh, I have, I have fallen into sin. It's not just, oh, I got drunk this weekend. It's so much more than that because it's the attitude of the heart that God looks at. God looks at the heart. And if you read this passage, we're able to see the compassion, the mercy, the grace, the love that God has for his children. That despite of our wandering, despite of our own ignorance, and as we continue to seek after other things, trying to fill our void, God always responds in grace. Despite what we have done. This son did the thing that was it's, it's unspeakable. The dishonor. Read the book of Leviticus. He deserved to be stoned. But what does a father do? When he sees his son from a long way off, he doesn't wait with his arms next to his sides. What are you, like, are you going to say something? He, the father's not like, did you really change? Did you really repent? Are you really sorry for his like, like, No, God, the father doesn't do that in this passage. When he sees his son coming, the father is the one who initiates. The father is the one who goes to the son. Like, I, I love this passage because even though when we think we're drawing, trying to draw closer to God, guess what? God is drawing closer to us as well. When we think, oh, like, I want to chase after God, I have a hunger for God, guess what? It's God who first made the way by dying on the cross for you and I so that we can have a relationship with him. This is who our God is. That when we are struggling with sin, when we're intentionally sinning against God and we carry that guilt and shame, I have great news for you and I, that, great, that the grace of God abounds all the more, that the heart of God is, 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 is compassion, it's mercy, it's grace. So what does he do? What does the Father do? When the son comes, the father runs to him, right? And back then, according to this culture, fathers never ran because it was a sign of not having dignity. But the fact that the father was urgent enough, willing to put his identity on the line, he didn't care because all he cared about was loving his son. That's the same thing that Jesus does on the cross for us. He didn't care about his dignity, but he bore all the shame, all the humiliation, uh, and all the sins of the world so that you and I can actually receive the love of God. We could be redeemed. We're no longer sinners, but now our identities are in Christ. This is great news, right? Great news that despite our sins, God still wants to love us. God still pursues after us. How great is this, right? Because for me, I have I can I, I, I could I could write a 10-page resume of why God shouldn't love me. But none of it changes mind because the cross is still greater. In this passage, what we see is midway, halfway throughout the apology, 
The father tells his servants, hey, come, bring out the best robe. A robe that resembles, that, 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 that symbolizes identity. A covering. An, um, it, it, it was a sign for everyone watching. Because everyone who's there, right? Everyone who's watching, they're like, this son is going to be stoned. How dare this son even come back? So disrespectful, so disgraceful, so dishonoring. But the father brings the robe in front of everyone watching, puts on this robe, which is a sign of identity. That, hey, you know, even though you want to be a hired servant, no. You are my son. You belong to me. Despite the way you lived, despite what you have done, you belong to me. The ring resembles great affection, a covenant, a promise of that intimate relationship, right? Shoes, because many theologians believe the prodigal returned barefoot. I mean, this guy was living in pigs. He had no money. If you, want to, if you went around barefoot, that symbolized that you were a slave. The fact that the father gave him shoes, it was a restoration. Um, it, it, it was a symbol where he has nothing else but a son. Although he, may have, he might have lived recklessly, although he might have lived with the pigs, although he was a slave, he is still my son. He's not a slave. He is my son. I, I love this because this is a story of restoration. Isn't this the gospel? Like the gospel is a thing that restores our hearts. Like I, I got to be careful when I say this because Many times when we say the gospel is what we need to fulfill our hearts, does it mean that we can ignore our physical needs, right? I like guess what? We need to be in community. It's a biblical thing. When people say, I experience loneliness and God's presence is enough, well, well, let, let, well let, let's hold on there, right? Like, no, God's presence satisfies us, but we as people, natural people, we need to be in community, Right? Like, guess what? I could be super spiritual, but that doesn't mean I'm not, I don't need to eat or drink, right, or use the bathroom. Like, there are things that a person needs, but as much as we have needs physically, we have needs for our souls as well and needs to find satisfaction. And as people, we know we have voids in our hearts, and we try to find it in this world. My prayer is that it will be found in Christ. I love this because they begin to celebrate. If you guys get to know me, I love not to party. You know, yeah, I, I, I love to celebrate. You know, I love to party in a way where it edifies people and then it glorifies God. Like, um, I, 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 there, there's one of our um, college students back at home he, uh, we sent him off because he's going on an eight-month mission trip. We went to like a Korean restaurant that fit like 20, 20, like 25 of us. Big party, right? We go, and they gave us our, our own room, right? The moment the door closed, I'm like, yeah, I'm dancing. I'm like, we're going to eat. We're going to celebrate. Like, this is great, right? Because this brother came a long way. It was definitely a headache to me, right? But came a long, long way. And I'm like, there's no way someone like you wants to serve God. But I don't, I don't, I, I can't say nothing because look at me, right? I, I say this because I was celebrating because it was such a great moment that my brother wants to live a life where he glorifies God. He was one of the most selfish people I know, right? Everything he does is for himself, manipulative, always lying, cheating, and now it's, I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for God and other people. I was celebrating. We're eating good food. We're cracking jokes. We're super loud, obnoxious. The moment it ended, we're like, you know what? Let's pray for our brother. Like, 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 like a lot of us, we're like goons. We're clowns, right? So right before we're about to pray for him, we're like beating him up, right? We're like praying for him. I'm crying. We're like praying. We're praying. After we prayed, we beat him up again, you know, like... <laughs> It was funny. I, I, I share this because celebration is something from God, right? If you read the book of Psalms, you know, happiness was always tied in with praise. If you read just the Bible itself, it is filled with festivals because God is a joyful God. And while they were celebrating because the younger son has returned home, I feel like many of us would 
kind of relate with the older brother. Let's read. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drawn near to the house, he heard music and that He heard dancing, right? Think about what kind of party this was, right? He heard dancing. They knew how to celebrate. They knew how to rejoice. Verse 26, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf. Man, this guy ate Peter Luger's, right? Because he has received him back safe and sound. <clears throat> but he was angry and refused to go in. So his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look. <laughs> that's, that's bold, right? Like, man, that's bold. These many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. I didn't grow up in the church. I'm the first Christian in my family. You know, my, my past pretty rough. Like I shared with you guys, um, I was a rebel, gangster, thug, fighting people, running away from the cops. This is my past, right? And after I became a Christian, after I became a pastor, I, I've met many people thinking that they need a past like mine to really encounter God. You don't. Amen. Please, do not think you need a crazy past to have a crazy relationship with Jesus. Like, that's, that's not the case. Don't ruin your life, okay? <laughs> If I could turn back time, I wouldn't live the way I did, right? I would just fall in love with Jesus. That's it, okay? I say this because many people told me, because you love God so much, I want to live like you did. And it's not fair because I feel like God is always blessing you, but I feel like God is never blessing me. When we go to retreats, when we go to revivals, when we go to praise nights, I feel like you're always being encountered with God. But I'm over here doing everything for God. I'm serving. I'm being a good son. I'm being a good daughter. I'm doing all of these things. But I feel like the blessings just keep being skipped over me and goes to other people who are really sinful. I empathize with that, right? Because think about when all of your hard work isn't being appreciated. Think about when you're doing all of these things and you're not even being noticed for all of your work and your efforts. I, I know that as a pastor, I, I know how that feels. But I think it's because many times we, we, we get it wrong. Like we, we, we think God is someone who rewards us. I think mean, God does give us rewards, right? But we got to understand that God is known to be, a one, to be the one who gives gifts. Guess what? December 4th comes along, I get gifts. Not because I earned it. I did nothing but to just receive a gift because it's my birthday. I didn't work hard for it. I didn't earn it. There's nothing I did with my own strength to receive a gift. It's just because it's my birthday. I get a gift for breathing, right? <laughs> there are times I come home and my wife surprises me with gifts. It's not because I'm such a great husband. You know what, Patrick? Good job. You're such a good husband. You deserve a gift. Like, no, that's not what it, what it is. It's because my wife loves me, she wants to show her appreciation, and, 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 it, and it is expressed in a gift. It's not earned. It's not achieved. You don't work for it. It's freely given. I say this because many times we think we got to work our way to receiving blessings from God. I got to pray more fervently so that I can encounter God at this retreat. I got to pray more fervently, read my Bible diligently, so then I will get this promotion. And we think to ourselves that if we do more, God will give more. But that is not the case. See, we think the more we receive, the more satisfied we will be. No, that is not true. Satisfaction will be found in God alone. That's why it says in this passage, verse 31, the father says to him, son, you are always with me. I got to say this again. The father looks to the son who's complaining, grumbling, 
mad disrespectful, right? Like, imagine if I went up to my mom, and for those who are current, I'm like, yeah, you know? So dishonorable, right? Like, like that's so, like, who would do that, right? It's like if one of you guys went up to Pastor Steve, like, look, Steve, you're like, you go to hell, right? Like, no, right? Like, who would do that, right? That's what he does. He's like, look, right? The audacity he has, he doesn't even consider his younger brother his own brother. He goes, this son of yours, not my brother, by the way, this son of yours. But how does the father respond? It's, he says, son, I, I love this. Because even when the attitude of the older son is grumbling, right, he still reminds him of his identity, son. I, I love this because whether it's the younger son or the older son, the father still reminds them of both of their identities. Regardless of their sins, although it looks different, the father still responds in grace and compassion and mercy. He says, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. I'm like, really, God? Because I see other people with Lamborghinis and I can't even afford to drive a car, right? I see other people eating, eating decent meals, but I'm over here eating spam every single day because I just can't afford food, right? Like there are moments even in my life I can recount where it's like, God, I feel like I've been, really, uh, I've been a, such a good Christian. Why is nothing good happening to me? We could pray for our needs. We got to do our own part in finding those needs, right? People who want to be in community, I'm going to say, look for community be intentional. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult, but look intentionally. Do your part. For those who need a job, guess what? Do your part. If you just pray to God, God, give me a job. You think on one day because you prayed hard enough, God's just going to give it to you? Probably, but what we must do is we got to apply to jobs, right? We got to do our part. I want to share a story. Community college, I had a math test. I suck at math, right? Even though I'm Asian, I suck at math. <laughs> I suck at math. Pastor Steve, I love your laugh. Anyways, <laughs> I, I'm horrible at math, right? I tried to study. Didn't make sense. Go to class, right? I prayed, right? Because this is right when I became Christian. God, I believe in you. I trust in you. If you walked on water, water, I could pass this test. Guess what happened? I failed. <laughs> I think I had like a 32%, right? I'm like, geez, I was discouraged. Prayers don't work. No, guess what I realized? I got to do my part and study, right? What, what should I have done? Pray more fast? Read the Bible? No, right? I mean, yes, I could have, but I should have looked for a tutor, right? I should have talked to my professor, emailed him, talked to my professor, try to see how I could understand this math concept. I don't remember, right? <coughs> I say this because although we have many needs, we should do our part, pray about those things. But guess what? Being satisfied, it's not about what we could do. It's not about what we can earn. It's not about the blessings that, that God gives us. It's not about what God can do for us. It's about God himself. Please don't get this twisted. People seek after encounters with God. People seek after materialistic blessings. Although they are blessings, people seek after these things thinking it's going to satisfy them. It'll make us happy. It'll make us easier. It'll make us happy for a temporary moment. But guess what? To be satisfied? We cannot find this. We cannot find that in this earth, in this world. We, we can't. Because satisfaction for our soul is not, a, it's not, earth, it's not an earthly thing. It's a spiritual thing. And that spiritual void can only be filled with the things of God. Please know this. It's not just the prodigal son. This is the prodigal of two sons. Both of them wander away from the father because they're trying to fill their void. The younger one filling their void in the world. The older one trying to fill the void by doing good things. And they both miss the point. Because it's not just about doing good things. It's not just about trying to find pleasures in this life. It's about being satisfied with the father alone. Being satisfied with God because it's a relationship. 
it's not just a religion. Christianity is a religion, but that doesn't complete, that doesn't give us the right picture of, of, of who our Jesus is. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. The knowledge of God is not just intellectual. It becomes intimate. Being satisfied with God. That's what this passage is about. There are people who find God useful, but I don't believe, I'm not convinced that they actually understand the gospel because gospel-centered people find God beautiful. He's not just someone they go to because they have needs. He's someone they go to because they love that person. Many of us, guess what? We all have needs. I have many needs. We got to fill those needs. Amen. We have to. We should. So we can live an easier life. But now, as a brother, I want to remind us that the voids that we have in our hearts, not the needs, not the physical needs, but the voids that are empty in our souls, it could only be found in the Lord. When we have damages of our, in our souls, when we have trauma, when our souls are damaged, our tendency, our triggers make us think that we got to go to these things to fill our void, to heal the wounds of our souls. But we got to be reminded once again that the only person who could satisfy that is God himself. I want to end with this. Um, can I have the praise team up, please? Thank you. <clears throat> I wrote this down. Religious people go to God to get what they want. Gospel people go to God to get God himself. We expect rewards from God when we do good things. And, um, you know, we think that if we do more, God will give us the fat and calf. God will give us that promotion. God will give us that relationship. God will give us materialistic blessings. But then true gospel-centered people will understand good things we do for God. We do not because we get something from God, but it's because we already have received God himself. Like I said, it's a relationship. A relationship. It's a relationship with God. Being satisfied in your hearts because you have Christ himself. Is it okay if we can all stand? In the moment where the younger son came home, they celebrated because it was fitting for that moment. So of course, it's deserved, right? Or, but I, I sense many of us are like the older son. When we look at other things, when we compare ourselves with other people, we're like, God, how about me? You know, and I'm gonna be honest, ain't nothing wrong. I'm gonna be honest, I understand and empathize because there are moments I'm like that too. But I got to remind myself once again that, hey, you know what? Even though it may be fair, the mindset I got to have, it needs to change. Because I got to understand that the things I'm seeking won't fill me. It'll make me happy for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, but it won't fill me, right? It won't satisfy my heart. It won't satisfy my soul. What I'm longing for, what my soul is longing for, I think is these things around me in my life, but we must understand that longing is something that only God can fill. We have a God-sized hole in our souls. We try to fill it with many things, but of course nothing is big enough to fill it. But it is only God Himself. And I love this because God knows this. God knows it. There will be no way for us to 
fill that void within our own works, our own selves. So what does Jesus do? Because our God is a God of mercy and love and grace, He died on the cross once and for all to pay for all of our sins, our past, present, and future sins so that you and I can be satisfied in Him. That the wrath of God will pass over us and the things that, will, that we will receive is His blessings, as a satisfaction we will find for our souls. That is who our God is. My prayer is that now we will begin to change our minds. We will begin to repent and have a right posture of heart before God. Saying, God, I was seeking after these many things. I was seeking after this. I was seeking after control. I'm seeking after the security. But Lord, in this moment, I'm reminded once again that only you can satisfy. I'm going to pray for us and it will be led into worship. And before I pray, can we just spend a few moments in prayer in our own, with our own selves and I'll close in prayer. Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear loving and gracious Father, we thank you and we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we're so grateful to have a God like you. That you are mindful of us, that you know us, and that you know the needs of our very own souls, Lord. Father, many of us grow tired and weary because we chase many things thinking that it will satisfy us. But once again, we are reminded today that only you satisfy. Just like the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall have no lack because you alone, God, can fill the void in our hearts. Though we hunger and thirst for many things, though our souls has a big appetite, remind us once again today, God, that only you can truly satisfy, that we could find true contentment in you and you alone. Father, I want to pray a blessing over my brothers and sisters. Lead them closer to your heart, God. Any needs that they may have, God, I ask that you may fill it Give them the strength to put in their efforts. But God, may you fill the needs that they may have. But for the souls, Lord, may they come to you. May they surrender to you. May they lay there. May they lay down themselves before you, God, so that they may receive you and know you and walk with you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. And we pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen.